This is Defenders TV Podcast, episode 205, where we're talking to you today about our spoiler-filled discussion of Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. What's up, fellow Defenders? We are back. It is coming to the end of 2018, but you know what we needed to do? Oh, yes, we had to give our spoiler-filled discussion of Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. And this is 205th episode, so you know it's going to be good. I am Chris, one of your hosts, and I'm joined by illustrious Spider-themed co-hosts. Hello, I'm Jolly John, the spider joke. (laughs) <laughs> insert spider joke here i'm derek <laughs> like uh, a christmas card absolutely welcome back fellow defenders yes i think we're actually into 2019 by the time we'll have this episode out it might be late but we had to do it it's an excellent excellent film uh spider-man into the spider-verse really enjoyed it so we had to talk about it and we needed chris our friendly neighborhood spider fan to t- talk with us about it so uh, welcome back as we have said this is a very spoiler filled discussions we will get into every nook and cranny of this film but before we got into any of that we did want to just have a brief discussion between the three of us about why you should go see it Uh, because we've heard a few people say well it's not for me or this or that or different things so we want to kind of just chat through about no matter what your age are you could be a cat and a cat should go see this film (laughs) it's even made for pigs it is Mm -hmm. like it's literally all all animals of the multiverse um so we're gonna have a quick discussion that and then we'll go through our usual production notes details and then into our top five points um so as of right now we'll we will stay spoiler free Mm -hmm. uh, and when we go into spoiler filled discussions we'll uh, kind of set the alarms off so if you haven't seen it you can pause at that part so gentlemen Mm -hmm. why should people go see this film the way i've been describing it to everybody that i'm talking to and everybody i'm recommending spider-man to the spider-verse 2 is it's like seeing your first anime movie. It's like seeing your first Studio Ghibli movie, for example, or Pixar movie, or your first Disney movie, if you're a bit younger than that. It's something brand new. The animation in this movie is something you just have to go and see. It's so much better than than we can even describe it as being. Sitting in that cinema watching this movie, seeing all of the techniques that everybody involved in this production is using to get this story across is just fascinating. It had me giggling and crying at times like it's so well put together it kept being advertised over and over again as the new movie from the people that brought you lego batman and the lego movie those movies are terrible in comparison to this they're just throwing crap childish jokes at the screen over and over again in order to sell their toys that's not what spider-man to the spider-verse is about this is done with love from everybody involved with the production and everybody in the animation studio is going we're going to give the best animated movie we possibly can. And I think they delivered. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, just like leave everything at home and go and see this. Like my concern was like, you know, is it going to be like the Lego movies? Cause I just really didn't like them. As mm-hmm. soon as I heard it, it was from the creators of that. Like, um, I was like, uh Oh, um, similarly, you know, this is something that if you have listened to the podcast, you would know, I do like Spider-Man, absolutely, but it's a little bit of Spider-Man fatigue has crept in. I mean, Homecoming kind of broke that a bit for me. Um, but I, again, I was there thinking, okay, am I really going to sort of enjoy this? But this movie, and I call it a movie because I think it kind of, the animation is amazing, but you know, it's action packed. It's funny. Um, but I think importantly, this is a movie that is massively self aware of its history, Mm -hmm. its place in comic book culture, its place in, I think, popular culture generally. It's got emotion, action, comedy, uh, all that great animation, um, great direction, lovely style to it. And I would agree. It is for me like seeing, um, Pixar and just going, wow blown away because um this is better than most live action movies i think to be perfectly honest um and that's just testament to the amount of care and attention that has been put into its production so Mm -hmm. yeah i'd definitely go and see this you know just leave any baggage you have at home 
uh, and get out to the cinema to see it for sure. Yeah. First of all, this is a, an evolution of animation, I think, um, in that they've chosen a particular style, which is jarring at first in that it looks like an animated comic book. They have imperfections. If you look close enough, it looks like it was printed as a comic book. Mm-hmm. And there sometimes it even has the imperfections where the ink shifts. So it actually is an animated comic book. Mm-hmm. So if you like comic books, even just the animation style is very intriguing. Like to the point where I saw someone get up out of our screening and go and ask about fixing the projector. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone has like said something similar about the shifting of focus because it is such an, it, it's such a new technique. Mm-hmm. And then they start using the, the paneling. They use the letterboarding. They use the twip. Uh, so like even the actual, when he is swinging, you will see Spider-Man and you'll see the twip sound mm-hmm. and it's written. They've started, they start layering that on. This could be the future of comic book movies to a degree, animated comic book movies mm-hmm. or seeing animation. I'm sure we'll get into details of it as we go into the podcast itself, but definitely I think our main six protagonists are six spider people that we see or spider things that we see on screen. Each one of them has their own animation style as well, so merging the six of those together is also a really interesting style yes. in itself, you know. Miles is our main character but everybody else comes from a different universe and everybody else has their own style i love that touch it's so well worth seeing uh, just to kind of round out this starting point because we have so much more to talk about um we normally keep our feedback to the end of the podcast but all of the feedback we got was actually boiler free because everybody just wants to recommend this movie um stash biggins over on our facebook page says the best spidey movie ever the end credits excellent great movie love the animation a refreshing take on spidey comics and animation Trevor Green says, my favourite movie of the year. Yeah, Ben Rush says, this is a brilliant movie, best spider adaptation ever, and the end title scene in tears of laughter. <laughs> Terry Ogly says, I really enjoyed this one. The kids have declared this their favourite. Lots of heart and fun animation style. I would definitely recommend it. I think that's a really interesting point, actually. Lots of heart indeed. I mm-hmm. think you really feel that through the movie. Mm. Definitely. Salim Kilsler says, very fun movie. The characters were excellent and backed by some very accomplished actors. Really cool to see just a few of the Spidey variants. Mm. Rounding out the group, David Wang had this to say, and I think we'll all agree. You're going to need more than five points per host. Yes, David, it's a lot to go through, but we'll keep it condensed to the five because... That's what we do. And we have an illustrious Lord producer who keeps us in check. <laughs> uh, to round this out, and I think this is the thing, this is a movie for the kids. But more importantly, this is a movie for everyone. Mm-hmm. There's adult jokes in there. There's uh, kid jokes in there. There's beautiful animation. There's lots of heart. There's lots of comedy. It's just an all round good film. Mm-hmm. So it's a fun day out for everyone. If you have the granny, the granddad, the grandkids... You, your children, I, the the dog, bring them all to the cinema. Maybe not the dog, but just bring them all to the cinema and you will all find something to love about this film. I think your pet pig would probably uh, love it. If you have a pet pig and you can get them into the cinema and get me a photo of that, I don't know what I will get you. <laughs> I will find you. I will. I will just... Like, send you whatever I can, because that is what I want to see. If you can put a fake Spidey mask on the pig at the same time, it would be even better. <laughs> love it. Love it. The suit will always fit. Gentlemen, let's get into our spoiler-filled discussion of Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Or dare we say it's Spidey-filled. It's this is Spidey-filled. There are a lot of spiders to fit into this. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Do you know what I love about animated movies, guys? I love how different the directors and the writers are on these movies. You know, these directors that come onto this project, they're on it for like five years. So generally, something that they've made in the past could be years and years ago and you haven't heard from them. Well, the reason is because they're working on this project. We've got Rodney Rothman working on this project. Uh, he was the writer and producer on 22 Jump Street, who worked with uh, Lord and Miller on that on that production. Uh, we also have uh, Peter Ramsey on this. He directed Rise of the Guardians, but he's been a storyboard artist back from the 80s. He worked on Nightmare on Elm Street 5, worked on Fight Club, Minority Report, Adaptation. <laughs> he worked on God. Godzilla, and all the way up to Sausage Party a couple of years ago as well. So loads and loads 
the storyboard work, but his directing job for the last couple of years has been on this. We've also got Bob Perchetti, who was a storyboard artist with Ardman, uh, worked on Flushed Away and the wonderful Curse of the Were Rabbit. Love that movie. Absolutely love it. I, I, and I love, I have to say, every single one of these directors has a piece of work that you can see some of it in this film. Mm, yeah, 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 definitely. Um, and I think that's pretty the part of it. Absolutely. Who was it written by? Uh, the movie was written by Rod- Rodney Rothman as well, uh, with Phil Lord. Weirdly, even though Christopher Miller and Phil Lord tend to get interviewed quite a lot about this project, Miller was actually just a producer on this project. He wasn't a writer or wasn't a credited writer for this. Uh, Phil Lord is working with somebody else, really, on this. And I think they probably benefited from that separation. I think um, Phil Lord Slightly. did a really yeah. good job on this. I just haven't been a huge fan of anything other than his Jump Street movies. Um, I think he did a reasonably good job for the kids on the Lego movie and Lego Batman movie, but I personally wasn't a huge fan uh, of those movies. Yeah, and then, of course, uh, he infamously, along with Christopher Miller, got fired from Solo, a Star Wars story. Mm. So, uh, yeah, interesting. Nice to, to see that you can bounce back from that, you know, um, given that, you know, movie industry is such a project based kind of, uh, endeavor. Uh, you know, it, it, it feels strange that sometimes this idea that, you know, they wouldn't make a, another big movie after that, mm-hmm. um, would be strange. So it's nice to see that they have recovered from that, you know, maybe slightly less enjoyable time <laughs> in, in their careers. Um, so yeah, good to see, uh, a nice bounce back here. Absolutely. Well, it works out really well because obviously this movie was in production for about five years. So while they did have the bad experience with Solo, this hopefully will keep them in the good graces uh, where they'll get another project after this. Well, the success of this film means there are at least two other films in the, in the sequelized running now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, basically Lord has come out to say, that he's started work on them. Mm-hmm. Um, so we know that there is futures for Rothman and Lord. Yeah. Lord and Miller work together so closely. Yeah. It's a bit like the Russo brothers. He probably bounces ideas off Miller as they kind of are doing other things and went, okay, you're going to get a production credit. I was genuinely quite surprised that Miller didn't have a writing credit. If you've heard the Empire podcast, the spoiler podcast about this movie, it is Lord and Miller talking about their process of writing this. Uh, this movie. So I was really surprised that he doesn't have a writing credit on the film. So <laughs> that, that really was, was weird. But do you want to tell us who starred in the film? There are so many wonderful actors in this project. Shamik Moore uh, plays Miles Morales. He's best known for his work on the TV show, The Get Down on Netflix. Um, Liv Schreiber plays Wilson Fisk. He played Sabretooth in Wolverine, you know? Oh, yeah. We've got, Chris, we've got Chris Pine as Peter Parker in this universe. That's basically all of the movie Chris is now in, uh, in the Marvel universe, right? We have every single Chris, yeah. uh, who's an actor yeah. is now in the Marvel universe. Uh, plays Captain not me, Kirk, obviously. Not me. Not me. You're a, you're a podcaster in the Marvel universe, Chris. That's true, but I'm not in the, the, uh, fair point. <laughs> Technicality, you get you win on this one. I got it. I got it. Uh, for us on Defenders TV podcast, we have Mahersha Ali in here playing Uncle Aaron. He played Cottonmouth Stokes, obviously, one of our favourite characters on the cage. So, yeah. uh, great to see him in here. There's also Brian Tyree Henry, who is Miles's father, uh, Jefferson Davis. He is best known from Donald Glover's TV show Atlanta, where he plays Glover's cousin. And of course, Donald Glover played Miles's uncle Aaron in Spider-Man Homecoming mm-hmm. as well. So, yes, a little bit of web weaving going on here between live and animated movies. Mm-hmm. I will quickly interject with a piece of history here. So, um, the history of Miles Morales from a comic book form came back in the early days where Mark Bernardin of Fat Man on Batman, uh, or Fat Man Beyond fame, I should say, works for Kevin Smith now. Um, he wrote an article about why can't Spider-Man be black? Mm-hmm. If you can find it, it's a fantastic read. Essentially then, Donald Glover kind of started leaning into this. This was around the time of community um and as a joke he leaned really into it mm-hmm. right, well you say joke there's an episode where he actually is he wakes up and apparently he he wouldn't dress in what they wanted him to he dressed in full spider-man outfit mm-hmm. um for the beginning of the episode because he was like i want to play spider-man so he started then jumping really deep into it oh yeah and all the interviews saying to everyone i'm going to play spider-man i want to play spider-man mm-hmm. uh then we see bendis making the miles character um, it, Miles character came out just literally around that time. Um, and the, Bendis is known for saying that he was influenced, not he took this. He was influenced by this character creation. So 
It's interesting. Donald Glover has always said he wanted to play Miles. Mm-hmm. Obviously, he's too old to play Miles. Um, but you could say that he was almost like the uncle of Miles. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then also we see him playing the uncle of Miles and in, in Aaron. Um, it's really interesting to see how this all comes together. Yeah. It's all a uh, six degrees of separation of weaving entangled webs yes yeah absolutely and i know there was one of the reasons that there was such a bad reaction to andrew garfield as spider-man was because donald glover was in the running to play the part i'm not too sure whether sony were looking to make miles morales or uh peter parker as uh, played by donald donald glover at the time but i know some of the bad reaction to another spider-man played by andrew garfield was because donald glover was was looking to do something different yeah. with the role so uh, so great to see him in here loads of other actors in this movie we've got nicholas cage of spider-man noir yay Woo! <laughs> he's played ghost rider twice in the cinema so another marvel character for for nicholas cage under his belt he's also played superman in a movie that wasn't produced he's played his Death version of, of batman and kick-ass so he's in for every comic book movie, and I say give him every role in every comic book movie. He's brilliant at this. <laughs> if he's on for him, he is amazing. I love him. I just literally, anytime I heard him, I just have face off, face <laughs> off, face. <laughs> like, ever since, ever since that film, that's all I can hear. <laughs> he's such a distinct voice. Mm-hmm. Actually, ne- like, I never would have placed him as Spider-Man Noir. Like, in that kind of style. Now, anytime I read those comic books, it's just going to be that voice in my head. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Uh, another wonderful Aunt May to add to our roster. We have Lily Tomlin playing probably the oldest version of Aunt May that we've seen on screen, but she's fabulous. She is a great actress, a great comedian back from the 70s and Saturday Night Live. She does Grace and Frankie on Netflix as well at the moment. Uh, really well worth the watch. Definitely check it out. Uh, Zoe Kravitz plays MJ in this movie. She played Angel in X-Men First Class as well and was recently in The Crimes of Grind- Grindelwald, the new uh, Harry Potter movie. Uh, really good. And another great piece of casting. I love this uh, uh, Marvin Crondon Jones the third plays Tombstone. If you've watched the TV show Black Lightning, he plays the bad guy on that. He plays Tobias uh, Whale uh, on there. So really cool to see him acting in the role of, of uh, Tombstone for a very small role this time, but loads of good villains in this movie. Yeah, and I just want to call out Luna Lauren uh, Valnez, who plays Miles' mum. Mm-hmm. She was Lieutenant Maria Laguruta in Dexter. Yes, she was. I, I really liked her take on this character as well. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Definitely. John, do you want to tell us what they all gave us with your synopsis for Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse? Sure. In New York, Peter Parker stops an attempt to rip the reality of space and time, and at the same time discovers that his world has another Spider-Man, as he saves a young man named Miles Morales, who was recently bitten by a radioactive spider from Alchemex Labs. However, in the ruined crucible of Dr. Liv Octavia's dimension-altering machine and witnessed by Miles, Peter Parker is killed at the hands or fists of Wilson Fisk, who is obsessed with returning his dead wife Vanessa and son Richard from another reality. Fisk fails in his attempt, but partially leaking other realities come into this world and with them other Spider-Men, women and pigs. As Doc Ock rebuilds the machine, Miles must quickly come to terms with his newfound powers and responsibilities, as he and the disparate group of spider heroes must race against time to save themselves from phasing out of existence and to fight Fisk's plans to protect all of their worlds. Good synopsis. So much going on in this film, obviously. Uh, there's really loads and loads of origin stories going on. Nice to keep it just to Miles, because he is our main character. And with great ability comes great responsibility. Chris, do you want to kick us into Miles' world with our point number one? Yeah, um, I really want to talk about just how they fleshed out Miles' world uh, in this introduction. Mm-hmm. This is probably what we would consider the, the standard Marvel Universe. They're, they're, there's the usual heroes, but you also have the, the, the setup of, you don't get introduced to Peter Parker first. Mm-hmm. You don't get introduced to, we get introduced to a young boy who is going about the usual things. I think he's about 15 in this film mm-hmm. and we see him, he's kind of getting ready for school. Yeah. Uh, you see his mom and dad kind of coming in. You see him working on these little stickers because he's the rebel that he is. Uh-huh. And he's walking to school and he gets caught by his dad tagging. Um, where you see him jumping and slapping, he's running down, he's saying eyes to films and he's running and slapping his stickers all over. And then you see that his dad, um, pulls him over mm-hmm. and we see that his dad is a cop and he falls right in front of the cop car. Yeah. Yeah. 
really good relationship between his mom and his dad at the setup of this uh, of this start of the movie with uh, with Miles. Uh, I love that moment with his mom where she's saying, "Hurry up, get out! You don't have time to do that. You don't have time to have breakfast." And then the doorstep, you see her outside hugging him, and he's going, "Mom, I've got to go. I don't have time for this." So both of them <laughs> saying they don't have time, but she's making time to hug her son and tell him how much he loves him. It's so unusual in these movies. We even joked about it back when we were doing our Defenders podcasts uh, about the TV shows. How few. Marvel characters have both parents and both yeah. parents that treat them well and love them. I love this with Miles. You know, he has a good relationship with his parents, even though he's, his father is a bit too clingy for him. Um, he stops outside of the school with, uh, and puts on his loudspeaker and tells Miles to tell him he loves him before he lets <laughs> him go for the week. You know, it, he really does care for Miles. Yeah, I really love is. this. Yeah. So I really enjoy this dynamic between the family it's just a standard teenager with his i don't want to hug you don't force me to tell you i love you in public Mm -hmm. i want to be cool there's no darkness there or it's just a nice family unit Mm -hmm. which i really enjoy yeah and the extension of that really is uncle aaron as well you know i like this choice of having miles much prefer the cool Uncle Aaron, the guy that lets him tag stuff. He lets him go out and do graffiti on walls in the city of New York, you know? Of course you're going to like Uncle Aaron more than you like your cop dad if he's going to let you do this kind of stuff in the city. But it's another nice teaching element for kids watching this movie. Don't just go for the cool person. They may be doing something that you don't know they're doing behind behind uh, your back. Go for your parents. They're the ones that give you the, the right instructions in life, you know. Uh, really nice touch in this film. Uh, Uncle Aaron's great. I love Mahershala Ali in this film. You know, he is just so cool that, of course, he's going to be able to have a move like just putting your hand on someone's shoulder and saying hey to them is going to get you their phone number. Of course, he's going to have that kind of move. But Miles isn't going to be that kind of character at all. Well, he could be at some day, but uh, no, not a, not initially. <laughs> um, I love the the apartment, even like getting to see um, the Aaron's apartment mm-hmm. and having like all the little the different kind of Easter eggs there, like the community, the poster, and there was stuff on TV. Um, so we see that uh, Aaron taught Miles to punch, like he's there with the punching <laughs> bag, kind of teaching him to fight, mm-hmm. it, and even the style. So you notice home is very light and kind of standard teenager, like beautiful, happy life. And then Aaron's apartment is dark with neon and very kind of like Ooh, underground. Yes. Suggesting something, I wonder. Mm-hmm. Ooh, Ooh, who knows? It was, yeah. Uh, that This was really cool, definitely. I really enjoyed then the, the take, just the introduction to the Vision Academy. Yes, the other side of Miles' life really is that he's also going to a really prestigious school. Like, you know, in the original creation of Peter Parker character, he is a really intelligent nerd who's really good at science and ignored and punched up and beat up by other kids. In this version of the origin story from Miles, he's been sent to Vision Academy because he's so, got such good grades and also wins a lottery to get there. Um, that's, yeah, it's a boarding school as yeah. well of sorts. Um, and I, I do like when he's, Going to the academy, you know, he bumps into the, the, the kids from his neighborhood mm-hmm. who aren't going there. And it is that kind of idea of different side of the, the tracks as well kind of brought in here. Yeah. But I, I, I do, um, this is, this is really cool. But I think just quickly as well for me, it's that, you know, as I say, you have miles at the center. And I think that's really, really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like the fact that there's familiar elements here, but it is different. It really is. Um, and I, I think that's really good. I mean, I was saying about spider fatigue, uh, at the start, but mm-hmm. for me, this just felt, as you say, fresh, light, um, different. Uh, as you say, Chris, that tagging element just, it's a, it's a great little touch yeah. that just yeah. adds some different personality to Miles that, yeah. that is very different. You know, he, he's clever and cool, dare I say it. Well, he's clever and desperately wants to be cool. Well, and I yeah. think that's something that really comes across very well with Miles. That's true. It's, it's one of those ones, you know, Peter Parker just desperately wanted to have friends when he was a kid and in school. That was kind of his whole dynamic. Whereas Miles just wants to be cool. It does everything to be cool. He doesn't want to be the nerd going to the prestigious school. He wants to hang around with the kids playing basketball down, uh, down the street. They all still seem to like him. That's why he's trying to get himself flunked out of, out of school, you know? Uh, I love that moment, just that little, 
tiny touch with his teacher where his teacher goes, you got every single answer to this question, to this test wrong. The only way you can do that is by knowing which answer is the right one and choosing the wrong one. You're too intelligent for this. You know, it's really yeah. good. That, 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 even when she just does, it's a zero out of hundred and then one and another zero. And yeah. you're like, he's like, damn it. <laughs> and also at Vision Academy, we do see uh, his partner in crime really in the comic books um this character was used as the basis of peter parker's uh friend in homecoming um he is a comic book character and he doesn't even get named in the movie uh yeah G- genki in the uh ultimate universe and, and now in the comics is miles Morales' best friend mm-hmm. um his partner in co- crime the uh the alfred to his batman right. if you will yeah. the best friend every man needs yeah. type of thing he, he's not given a name but is given two wonderful moments in the in the movie, uh, which we'll probably yeah. talk talk about as we get through our point number two, the spider origins, the other characters that are in this movie. There's so many spiders. We've got seven spider people or spider things in this movie, <laughs> uh, starting out with Peter Parker. Um, now, I I saw the trailers for this. I saw uh, bits of the movie before it came out uh, at, at the end of Venom uh, as well. I was totally convinced that this Peter Parker that we saw at the beginning of the movie was the Peter Parker that we were going to follow throughout the movie. I thought we were going to get a, a story about how he breaks. I love that we start out with perfect Peter Parker and they kill him off. That was a real surprise to me because I wasn't expecting that at all. Uh, Chris Pine's Peter Parker. What did you think, guys? Well, first of all, I didn't even know it was Chris Pine until the very end of the film when I saw the credits. Right. It did, didn't register to me, <laughs> uh, who, the, the voice. And I was like, like for such a small bit mm-hmm. uh, to get him in there, I was like, brilliant. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just... I loved seeing the short take on this yeah definitely I, and i think it only needed a short take i mean for most people this is their jumping off point uh to an extent mm-hmm. of the the peter parker the perfect peter parker that you know the peter a parker or what you know just to differentiate from peter b uh who i have a lot more affinity with i think um i just think that um you know it, it's it's the starting point this is the contrast with all these other different um spiders from different uh universes and dare i say it realms you know i i love the fact that from the same creative minds of stanley and ditko that brought doctor strange it makes for me perfect sense that there is this spider verse with different Mm spider-man whether it be a pig it could be spider ant who is an ant bitten by a spider mm-hmm. that who knows? Like, I love all these different origins that come here. And I think it's great that you have this very brief connection with Peter Parker. Uh, and it takes you down a route where, yeah, I mean, he gets pummeled by, uh, by Wilson Fisk. Yeah. Um, do it, you know, doing that classic Fisk, Fisk thing, uh, you know, where he's, he's chucking it down. We've, we've seen that in Daredevil where he just takes that, brutal physical anger and we and we get that here and mm-hmm. miles being the witness to it so um i i like that brief connection as well where the lives of miles and peter uh intersect and you get that brief bit of um advice uh and that idea that oh there's another spider-man and mm-hmm. um, within that single reality that one world and then we get introduced to all these other different spider heroes from the different realities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the one thing about uh, the perfect Peter Parker, uh, Peter A. Parker, whatever way you want to kind of (laughs) refer to him, um, he's the Tobey Maguire, Sam Raimi Spider-Man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, He's he's the Spider-Man of, he's been active for about 10 years, he's done the train scene from Spider-Man 2, he did the upside down kiss which they actually inverted, mm-hmm. which I loved, yeah. for uh, with Mary Jane from Spider Man One, where she was then hanging from um, a fire escape and he was standing on the ground, mm-hmm. which was a nice tweak. He talks about the stupid d- 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 dancing moment down the street from Spider Man Three. Mm-hmm. So I I loved the fact they did this because you have to remember for some people. Spider, the, what they know of Spider-Man is the movies. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that has anchored. It's giving them anchors of, you know, those bits that you've seen before. Well, that's, that's this Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And of course, you know, Spider-Man Homecoming only came out a year ago uh, or a bit over a year ago. So they're not referencing that. 
I did find it interesting that they didn't reference anything from the Amazing Spider-Man series, the much maligned version of the character. Um, they didn't re- make any reference at all to uh, Andrew Garfield's version of, of Spider-Man. But it was a really nice touch to have the Tobey Maguire version of Spider-Man in here. Speaking of Tobey Maguire, much rumoured, uh, wasn't chosen for the part. Unfortunately, he didn't, didn't get uh, the role, but he was rumoured to be Peter B. Parker uh, and play that character, the Peter Parker from another universe. Uh, that role went to Jake Johnson from Jurassic World. He was uh, the nerd in the uh, the nerd scientist that was in uh, Jurassic World. Um, plays this part of Peter Benjamin Parker uh, from the other yeah. universe. But it would have been a nice touch to have Tobey Maguire in there. I think that would would have worked. Whether Tobey Maguire was up for it or not, I'm not sure. But uh, it would have been kind of cool. It's it's interesting. Yeah, like I'm I'm happy with the casting. Of this no, me too. Because I know Jake Johnson from New Girl. Mm-hmm. And that slovenly Peter B. Parker that, that who's been doing it for, for like thirty years, who's jaded and everything's going to hell. Um, that is Jake Johnson to me. Yeah. That that's the I just want to eat pizza. I I know this all. I've been doing it. And the amazing part of this, and I'm going to move it to Peter B. Parker now, actually, because I want to talk about him as a character because. He, it's not jadedness, I think, is the, the problem he has. It's, he's seen it all before. Mm. So the, the goober, they call it as the key, yeah. uh, to save everything. He's like, it's a doohickey, a gizmo. I just call them goobers. Mm-hmm. And he's just like, yeah, I've seen it all before. I, he's like, he's been doing this for th- like, well, I think he said 20, 30 years. Like his life's going to ruins. The fact that Peter B. Parker is Jake Johnson is it's it's you see this more relatable oh, absolutely. Spider-Man. It's a really yeah. interesting one, isn't it? Because the the whole whole point of this character, and we see it throughout the story and his and his uh, journey throughout this movie is that he had a point in his life where he could be an adult. He's married Mary Jane. He's unfortunately lost Aunt May, which will happen in his life. But he's married Mary Jane, and she gave him the choice to be an adult and have kids and be a grown up. At the point that he chose not to be an adult is when his life started to go bad. She couldn't stay with him any longer because he wasn't growing up. And by the end of the movie, he has his transition to becoming an adult and realizing, actually, I could be a great father because of the relationship he has with Miles. Maybe I could be the kind of person that could have kids. And maybe we think possibly when he goes back to the other universe, he might be able to reconcile with Mary Jane. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, first off, I wouldn't change the casting from mm-hmm. uh, Jake Johnson in the slightest. He's great. Absolutely perfect. I think completely, probably one of the most relatable um, Spider-Men as a man yeah. speaking in his early 40s. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, things change. And I think that's the important thing about um, Peter B. Parker is that, you know, Peter Parker, uh, even to an extent, Miles Morales is of that constant youth you know it, it, it's kept in the uh the time where they are at school or in their early years and there is that exuberance and we've all had it and it's kind of the realities of adulthood where it's like oh house mortgage job wage taxes blah, blah blah all start creeping in and i love that that's exactly um what happens even down to the pot belly gut as well. There is that moment where he sort of is the in silhouette, I think, with that kind of pot belly gut. And I'm just there going, perfect. Yeah. That is <laughs> something, you know, the, the, the gut, the, all that. And I, I think it's, as you say, Chris, it's, it's that, uh, he's seen it all before kind of, but also just that he, is an older version of, of, uh, Peter Parker. Uh, yeah. And the realities of that, and it doesn't connect. It's that critique of, um, superheroes, you know, that they get older. What happens when they get older? Mm-hmm. Uh, how does that change them from the kind of, um, the exuberance of that you get, um, from the comic book or, or from the adaptation of that uh, yeah. in, in its purest form? And again, it's just a great contrast. And, that's why having him and Miles Morales, um, the, the interchange between the two of them is just so, so good. I yep. mean, that moment where they are thwipping through the trees after stealing the, the hard drive because the goober has been destroyed is just so, so good. And mm-hmm. um, whereas like, 
oh, I've got the hang of it now. I just love that where they're kind of getting into their thwipping uh, rhythm. Yeah. And even sort of outside the fire escape as well, where you've got amazing um, animation of uh, them walking down the wall and all that and then walking up the next wall. Yeah. And just you get this life story of Peter B. Parker, uh, but being told to Miles Morales, who is the the young the new kid um on the block and I, I just think that is just one of the best parts of this film is this interaction between the two it's funny it's touching it, it's moving as it goes through the story mm-hmm. um and again it, it's just so so good and i also like the fact that peter b parker is pretending to be better than he is as well you know that he opens that story about how he ended off in this universe by saying, I was in my apartment working on my bod, and actually it turns to him and he's actually sitting there eating a pizza, getting fat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to yeah. be better than he yeah. is. He wants to project himself as the best Spider-Man there ever was. But actually, he's someone that gave up, unlike the Spider-Man of this universe. That moment where you see the photograph of the Peter Parker from this universe, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Peter Parker, and you see this Peter Parker covered in bruises, Bags under his eyes, looking at it, going, it was like looking in a mirror when I saw this guy. Well, yeah, cracked yeah, mirror, yeah. a very different mirror from, from yourself. But I love that he has this moment of kind of going, well, maybe if I didn't make those choices in my life, I wouldn't have ended up like this. And it all reflected through Miles. So really, really good character. That actually brings us to the, the, the third, uh, spider person, mm-hmm. um, spider Gwen. I, I'm so happy they included Spider Man uh, yeah, as a character in this. Definitely. Um, she is one of my favorite additions to the, the Spider Mythos in the last few years. Um, but quick background. She was introduced in the Edge of Spider, uh, Edge of the Spider Verse, um, Spider Man event from 2015, I believe it was, where essentially she is Gwen Stacy. She is given she is bitten by the sp- uh, the spider in instead of her best friend Peter Parker. Mm-hmm. Um Peter Parker then becomes the lizard um and is eventually uh, and unfortunately dies and that becomes her uncle Ben moment. Mm-hmm. Um and she is a badass drummer from in a rock band the uh, the Mary Janes where Mary Jane is the front singer and I think Betty Brandt is also in the thing and they have a single and the art style is amazing um if you get a chance please go grab this comic and just have a look at that universe because what we see in uh this film when it goes through her timeline and who she is actually looks like it was ripped directly from the comics Mm. The art style, the, the, that kind of smudged kind of whites and pinks and everything, neons, is the art style we see in the comic books. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, and weirdly, she was created by Jason Latour. If any of our fellow defenders have been uh, listening to our podcast about comic books, we just covered uh, Jason Latour's Silver Surfer a couple of weeks ago uh, on our Defenders Best Defense comic book coverage. So uh, really interesting that his character has made it into these movies as well. But she's hugely popular. Uh, I love this concept of this of this version of Gwen Stacy, a character that was killed off in the original Spider-Man Peter Parker run yeah. um, and became a huge thing for him. He's the one that killed her by mistake by trying to catch her with uh, with one of his webbing and breaking her back. Um in this case, we have her coming to the forefront of it and becoming Spider Woman because he died, and he's the one yep. that is her Uncle Ben. So, a uh, really interesting version of the character, and I can totally understand why she's so popular. Yeah, in the film, she uh, gets blown back in time by a week when she lands in Miles' universe, mm-hmm. and she is she is quite smart herself. She is as smart as Peter Parker and Miles Morales. She is genius level intellect. Mm-hmm. So she follows what she considers the source of this kind of disturbance to the Visions Academy, where we get her the first introduction to her in her Gwen Stacy persona, mm-hmm. as and when she meets Miles, in, when Miles is late for class, it's a lovely interaction. So we start seeing this blossoming friendship, mm-hmm. potentially love interest, pretend like there's a bit of flirting. And then as Miles starts getting his powers, he gets his hand caught in her hair yeah. and we get the iconic uh, Spider-Gwen half-head shaved uh, look. Yeah. 
So cool. Because he rips out half of her hair on his hand. It is hilarious. I love that the next time we see her with the iconic haircut, Miles goes, great haircut. And she tells him, you don't get to comment on my haircut. Yeah. <laughs> she's, she's kind of embarrassed by this great looking hairstyle that she's created. But it's because Miles has pulled out half of her head of hair. Yeah. <laughs> the, the awkwardness between these two is great. I love that first moment of contact with the, yeah, what she calls a Gwendy or Gwendu. It's kind of relates almost to Wakanda. And she's like, I'm from Africa. No, South Africa. There's just this lovely <laughs> kind of awkwardness, even with Miles trying, you know, his Uncle Aaron's technique on, on this girl as well with mm-hmm. the, the hand on the shoulder. Um, it, it's all just really, really good. And of course, at right, at the end, there is this, as she's going back to her reality, you have that moment where, as you say, Chris, is there going to be this love interest here? But ultimately that they end off saying friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, it's a, it's a really good, uh, move through, um, this movie between these two, I think. Yeah, and once again, the arc for this character is that she won't have any friends because Peter Parker died. And by the end of the movie, she's, accepting that Miles might be a friend. So uh, nice yeah. touch. And she also finds a way back over. She finds a way to communicate to Miles at the end of the movie. So we know that she has some ability to travel possibly between universes. So that's a nice setup for a future movie. Um One of the things I also love about this character, and it's a really nice touch, as you mentioned, John, her trying to mask her name. Of course, she's going to mask her name because there's possibly a Gwen Stacy in Miles Morales' universe as well. Um And she knows that because she's a smarter character she is. Yeah. Um, she's played by Hayley Steinfeld, mm-hmm. um, who started out in True Grit, uh, but has become like hugely, insanely popular since then as a singer, as an actress, etc. And um, Derek, I believe she's in Bumblebee at the moment. Yes, yes she's in uh, the new Transformers movie, Bumblebee, set in the 80s. Apparently really good, but haven't got to see it yet. Excellent. I'm right there with you. I'm hearing amazing things. Yeah. Apparently, it's the Transformers we deserved. Yada, yada, yada. Mm. Um, but I'm like, I- I'll get there. <laughs> I still have to see Aquaman as yeah. well. I, this was my first point of call. Yes, absolutely. Okay, take us on to our next uh, three, and we can kind of go slightly quicker absolutely. in these Spider-Men. Uh, Penny Parker. Yes. Um, which is our anime... The uh, one I've never Parker. heard of. Really? No, I just yeah. hadn't heard of Penny Parker. Um, and yeah, just so amazingly, gorgeously weird and wonderful. I, again, absolutely love anime and having this character in there is really, really cool. I love that she gets her intro in exactly the same way as most anime characters. Um, when it cuts to her, her origin comic, you get that kind of fast paced animation from uh, from her really cool hadn't heard of her either uh, this is probably the least known of all of the um the spider people that we get in the in the movie i think she's only appeared in about two or three comics and maybe some yep. of the big crossovers um that she's appeared in so really cool to have her in there though and uh, really yeah. uh, really cool to having the robot as well the robot had those wonderful animations of the smiling yeah. face and the and the frenny face and the tear uh, which was just really affecting uh, in big moments throughout it yeah, I think so. And I think, uh, I think with all of these as well, it's, it's a movie that's massively self aware of its place. And, I, you know, I've said that. And I think none more so than where they retell the story of each of these Spider-Men as they're introduced, you know, where it's all quick fire. So it doesn't take a long time, but, um, it's all really good. You find out, you know, like in her case where it's her dad that has died and where she is, um, you know, in a telepathic contact with a radioactive spider, which she makes control of her father's mech that she's in. This one with the beautifully expressive digital eyes. Mm-hmm. The spider, the, the spider mech. Yes. yes. She's been in like three comic books, probably about four appearances overall. She's slightly more now because of Into the, uh, the Spider Geddon, um, arc. She was in one or two of them. Um, but she, I can see her blowing up now mm-hmm. because her character is actually quite interesting. Yeah. The art style is fun and, uh, people have been taking and running with this, um, since, um, She's played by Kimiko Glenn from Orange is the New Black. Mm-hmm. Really well-known Asian actress, which is fantastic. And yeah, it was just a nice... She's... I wouldn't say comic relief, because that's actually not true. 
every character has a comic relief element, but every character has a kind of serious moment as well. Yeah. I think yeah. she's fresh. I mean, it's just yes. like the whole concept of this telepathic contact in then her father's spider mech um, with the, the connection to the radioactive spider. It's completely fresh. Yeah. It's completely yeah. different, but very similar, yeah. <laughs> you know? And it's just like, oh, wow, okay. Who, who, you know, who thought this up? What, a, you know, that's really interesting. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. Really, um, really cool. And again, you know, completely different art style for this character. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about the other two characters in a second, but, uh, recently I heard the interview with the creators of this movie saying that that moment where all six of them are side by side on screen together took three months to complete because each one has an individual art style to them. Uh, yeah. that's fascinating. You know, just having all six of them move back and forth across the ceiling in, uh, in the, in the college took three months to complete. You know, this is what I love about animated movies. If they're done well, it means you've got loads of time to layer in jokes and loads of time to layer in really, really good complex characters like they do with Penny Parker, who's on screen for maybe 10 minutes in this movie, but you know who she is by the end of the movie and she has her own arc and you feel for her when the mech dies. You know, you feel the connection that she has with this last piece of her father, which dies in this universe and she has to go back with her radioactive spider to her own universe without the mech you know you do feel for her arc as well really like that yeah no and i i think that's the one of the amazing things about this film mm -hmm. the attention to detail yeah on like so as you said they're standing together but spider-man noir is in black and white and there's always wind rippling his jacket and stuff uh -huh. but then everyone else is still perfect so they had to animate his jacket and everything while they're probably potentially working on someone else who's talking. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's just this attention to detail. Yeah. So that yeah. brings me to Spider-Man Noir, which is fant another fantastic character. Probably my favorite and probably has my favorite, uh, moment in the movie <laughs> where, he's, so where he's looking at the Rubik's Cube going, this is green, isn't it? It's like, no, it's not. Is it blue? <laughs> yeah, I love it. It's Let's. like, colours have blown my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. It's, it's just a great touch. And again, he's made from newspaper print uh, throughout the movie. So when you see him, it's always the black dots and white dots from a newspaper, um, which yep. is a really, really nice nice touch for this character. Once again, some beautiful animation in there. Yeah, I absolutely love him. Um, so it's a 1930s noir Spider-Man um, and he's a great grizzled character. Mm -hmm. He has guns in the comic books. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have them here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is fine. It's a, it's still a kid's film. Mm -hmm. If you get a chance, there's only, he's only in a few comic books. Yeah. Uh, in his own run, it's kind of like a what if, uh, kind of else world story. It was in that weird period where Marvel were doing loads of noir comics where they did, uh, Luke Cage noir as well and yes. Spider-Man noir. So yeah, it's, it's a bit more for adults, uh, much more of a Max comic book or a Max version of Spider-Man, which is something you don't get to see very often. Uh, so definitely worth checking out. What I do love, you mentioned it, Chris, about the wind that's always going through and always passing by this Spider-Man noir. I love that it also gets everybody else. So if Spider-Ham is sitting on his shoulder, you see Spider-Ham's uh, hair going in the wind or his ears going in the wind as well. So uh, there, he is surrounded by wind at all times, yeah. which smells like rain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Strangely, I just want a really interesting one, if anyone's interested at all. The Vulture is a cannibal in his universe. It, that's how dark his universe is. So again, I'm very shocked they included him, but it's so happy they did. Yeah. Oh, definitely. definitely. Let's bring it into our final spider person thing. Yeah. Um, spider ham. Peter Porker. Yeah, from noir to cartoon. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. I love this. Um, I wasn't really planning on loving it quite as much as I did, but, uh, in particular around the fight where he's like, I'm a cartoon. Yeah. And as he pulls out his big mallet, um, <laughs> of course, which he gives to Miles Morales as a present, he says, and you can just put it in your pocket. It's just <laughs> like so, so good. You know, that nod to cartoons versus comics. Mm -hmm. I, and it's just really good. And of course, he, he's a little edgy as well. He's edgy comic. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, yeah. that with all this fun and craziness and silliness, some of it is a little edgy. Um, I'm still not entirely sure about his introduction where his hands are dripping with water, I suppose, uh -huh. or something. 
Um, <laughs> do we know what that was? He said he just washed his hands yeah. from being in the bathroom. Yeah. 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 Okay. Excellent. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that we got introduced to this character in the comic books as, a, and he's been a bit of a joke character. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a spider bitten by a radioactive pig that turns into spider ham. Yeah. Um, and it's just so much fun in the comic book universe. Mm -hmm. But as you said, he's a bit edgy in this. So they've, they've grown him up a bit. And this is the one that always makes me laugh because, you know, people that don't read comic books think that he's created for this movie. You know, they don't realize that, that Marvel have got this really weird side. They're not always just doing comic books. The way that we, that we see them where it's a long running series with, you know, commentary on everything that's going on in the world. They also used to do Not Brand Eck, which was their version of Mad Comic Comics, which featured characters created like their other characters. Peter Porker was involved in that as well. You know, that's where I first saw that character of Spider-Ham was back when I was reading those, those kind of com- comedy comic books that they did as yeah. well. Yeah, you know? it's anarchic in, in many respects, mm-hmm. and it, it does kind of slightly remind me of uh, one of my favourite comic books growing up, which is Oink. Again, uh-huh. around pigs, <laughs> weirdly, um, and this whole thing is anarchic, it's chaotic, uh, mm-hmm. and it's great, great fun. Yeah, no, I'm right there with you. So, that is the full list of our spider people things, and spider personas. Mm-hmm. Let's quickly jump into our villains as our point number three, and um, because we are given some fantastic villain arcs mm-hmm. and some one not so fantastic villain arc. Ooh. Yeah, I've listed out the villains, but gentlemen, I want to jump into one of the biggest reveals mm. of a villain in this, which is Olive Octavius, mm-hmm. the female Doc Ock who was in none of the promotional materials yep. and is a fantastic surprise. It's a fantastic take on this this kind of new look, new kind of crazy but not crazy um, Doc Ock. I really, really like the reveal with Peter B. Parker where he's kind of telling her, her his story, trying to kind of chat her up while Miles breaks into the computer. And then she straps him to a chair and starts experimenting on him, just like Dr. Octopus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's the big reveal. She rips off her jacket and then she's got the arms uh, behind her. Really great moments. And I also love, because in this universe, Peter Parker has been fighting all of these villains for years. I love when they have the fight in uh, Aunt May's house and she goes, oh, not live. Because she yeah, knows. Yeah. She's known yeah. all along yeah. that this is Doc Ock. We didn't because we're the audience. And Miles didn't because he's not involved in in Spider-Man's universe yet. So I love that they have this kept as a reveal from us, the audience, but everybody else in the universe kind of knows. And I, I like the twist on, oh, it's Doc Ock. You're Doc Ock. And she goes, no, my enemies call me Doc Ock. My friends call me Liv. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, you know, the, the abbreviation of Olive. And I just love... That is kind of that uh, other side of the world where the villains also have a social life, and you know she could probably goes out drinking with Fisk and so on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I loved, I loved that kind of little twist on, on that as well. Yeah, but this was just kind of a left of field for me, and I was like, that's a really nice way of doing it. As you said, just the the when they were trying to steal the computer, and she then ends up trying to kind of experiment on Peter B. It was just so much fun. Um, so mm-hmm. I was really happy that, that they did it this way. Yeah, they seem to do this in the Sony Spider-Man world uh, at the moment. This is what they kind of pinned Spider-Man Homecoming on as well, this relationship that they have. So the other big reveal in the movie we have is the Prowler, Miles' uncle. You know, this is a personal relationship to Miles, um, the person that he respects most. He respects more than his own father is actually the enemy that's been tracking him throughout the movie. Was this a big reveal for you guys or did you see it coming? So I knew this, I, I knew this from the comic books. They didn't come out and say it in such a way that I, I think for people who aren't aware of the comic books, it, it was mm-hmm. probably a nice reveal. John? Yeah, it was a nice reveal for me. I certainly hadn't guessed that at the start. I just assumed that the Prowler, kind of along with Tombstone and the, and Scorpion as well, there were just kind of elements here around kingpin mm-hmm. within this story um i wasn't um ultimately 
thinking of this dynamic. I mean, it was more about the dynamic between Miles, his uncle, and his dad, how he kind of looked up uh, to his uncle, certainly because they had that whole tagging moment down in in the basement where they do the big mural on the wall and there's that bond being developed. And yeah, okay, that works when he's introduced and shown or revealed to be the Prowler, absolutely. But in that moment in the story... I was seeing it as that um other side to his relationship with his father, mm-hmm. uh, saying that, you know, he kind of understands Miles and what he's going through, understands what Miles maybe wants to do with his life more so than his dad. Um, and so actually it works on so many different levels that it's really, really good. And of course it brings Miles into that first contact with Peter Parker because that kind of subterranean area is kind of, next to Fisk's big, or, or Liv Octavia's uh, big machine to, to bring these and distort these realities. So, yeah, this this was a really good uh, reveal for me, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think the only time that I realized it was Prowler is when Miles is going to his uncle's apartment and Prowler comes in through the window. I think at that moment I'm going, oh, of course, that's going to be his uncle, right? <laughs> it's definitely that moment. I uh, have to say another great touch in the filmmaking. There's a sound that's played every time Prowler is, is on screen chasing Miles, uh, similar to that kind of... Um, sound you hear in the Joker for the Dark Knight and it gets incorporated into the music when there is a big uh, chase between the two characters between Prowler and and Miles. It's a beautiful beautiful touch where you have this really great um, intense music playing over the two of them before they they reveal that it's his uncle. It's really really cool. Can I just say how beautiful that chase sequence is? Just mm-hmm. the animation yeah. that they and they change it from the trailers which is a new thing I love. I do like now that we are getting these edited versions of the scenes in trailers where they're taking things mm-hmm. out so it's still somewhat fresh when we see it again in the cinema. So when you see uh, Miles kind of just doing the, the running and the jumping and everything like that, it's still so nice. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Chris. Definitely, yeah. The, the actual scene where we saw the meeting of Peter B. Parker and uh, and Miles um we saw that at the end of Venom uh, in the cinema when it was when it was out uh, a couple of months ago. Um, I think they edited out the uh, gravestone of Peter Parker in there, which is the whole reason why the two characters are meeting. So even seeing that in the cinema with a slightly different take than we saw uh, when it was revealed at the end of Venom, uh, seeing that in the cinema as part of the film was a completely different take. And it's a funny moment. It's a great moment to have those two characters meeting in that way. So yeah, again, I love they're doing this when they're showing you bits of the movie in advance of seeing the full film they are editing it slightly to make sure you don't get the full context until you see the full movie. Yeah, I think that's come in a world where we've got teasers teasers for teaser trailers before the real trailer. Uh-huh. So we're getting these leading marketing lead times of up to two to three years. Yeah. So they need to show you scenes and kind of collateral and trailers and stills, but they need to do it in such a way that two and a half years from now, when you're looking at the film, you're still getting this fantastic, oh God, that was great uh, moment. And also there's tons of podcasts and tons of bloggers and videographers out there on YouTube who want to pour over every single piece of content and basically want to get the spoiler before the movie comes out. You know, it's something we don't generally do anymore. We don't really talk about the trailers for movies in the way that we used to in the past. We don't really do it as much as we used to. Kind of because, well, I want to see the movie and I don't want to get spoiled. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's kind of the reason. So, um, so I do like that they've decided to do this over at Sony as well, taking bits of the movie, cutting it and editing it in a way that they want you to see that this movie is exciting, but don't want to spoil the storyline for yeah. you. So and, and nice that they're doing that. Yeah. Uh, one of the, the other big villains, obviously, in the movie, we talked about him a little bit, but Kingpin, played by Liv Schreiber in the movie, a very different version of <laughs> of Kingpin than we've seen, um, probably because he's the size of a house with just a little head on yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> really interesting, uh, really interesting artwork for him. Yeah, I, I felt he was a little too big, mm-hmm. uh, to be honest, uh, in this, just that choice. Um it's, it's a very small, minor little, uh, pick from me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but ultimately I, I did like how threatening Kingpin was. I, I love the fact that without hesitation, without any kind of long drawn out, um, moment, he kills 
Peter Parker mm-hmm. right in front of Miles Morales. Like brutal. And it's with his fists. You know, it's that double fist. It, it's brutal. It's menacing. It's threatening. And he was with the final battle. Uh, with Miles Morales, it felt as though Miles was under threat, mm-hmm. um, and it was only the distractions of Vanessa and Richard sort of phasing through the different realities that kind of saved Miles Morales, like that chance, that luck event that happened in the machine. So I thought this was really good that they brought that level of menace, actually, for this character into the animation. Yeah. And I think that's where you can really say this is another sign that this goes beyond just simply um, a children's animation. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. It really brought in a significant menace for me, but I did think he was maybe a little too chunky, um, to be honest. But uh, yeah, really good otherwise. I love how imposing it makes him, though, as well. Well, that's and, true. Yeah. And as you say, he has that real personal connection with Miles because not only did he kill... Peter Parker, he also killed the Prowler. He killed Aaron, Miles' uncle. So he is a murderer in this story. I love that because we've just spent, you know, a couple of years talking about Wilson Fisk over on Daredevil. And you're kind of wondering, since he's such a big villain for Spider-Man, will we see him in a Spider-Man movie? Well, if we are going to, I like that they chose him for this movie as the, as the main bad guy and made him just as brutal as he is in the, in the Defender series. I'm right there with you. I think they could have done a remember the 90s animated spider-man where you Mm -hmm. you had an evil wilson fisk but he wasn't he wasn't this brutal and i think they've taken Mm -hmm. uh, an aspect that we've talked about in the daredevil netflix shows they've taken elements of that character and kind of imprinted him here still Mm -hmm. enough to make it a kid's film to degree because it still has to be pg-12s or whatever it was uh, mm-hmm. rated in the US but they've done it in a way that's he's evil they, I think they've made him uncompromising yes you know they don't necessarily show his violence but they show that he is violent and um, a danger and effectively morally kind of corrupt and evil so yeah. like they, they've shown that without necessarily showing um, the 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 final outcome of it. And that's what's really good. You recognize that this guy is very brutal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you think of his arc, guys? Because, you know, the idea here again is that Vanessa is the center of his universe. And by him attacking Spider-Man, and by Spider-Man attacking him, I suppose, uh, Vanessa and Richard are driven to run away because they see what this kingpin is capable of. And they die in a car crash. So this is where his blame of Spider-Man comes from. This is where he becomes the villain of Spider-Man is because he believes without Spider-Man, he would still have Vanessa and his son alive. I enjoyed this. Mm -hmm. I think it sets him up to be potentially the big, bad, ultimate villain for Miles. Mm -hmm. Like, to be fair, he has a a sad origin in this. His, yeah. like, yeah, yeah. he, his wife and child are dead because of him and he's doing all he can to bring them back. Mm-hmm. Um, in not a healthy way, but all he can to bring them back. Yeah. Like there is even that point where he's saying, I don't care if the universe is destroyed as long as I get yeah. them back. You know, he's, he's willing to throw out all consequences to get Vanessa back in his life and his son. Yeah. And it's where they could go with that. He could, he, mm-hmm. he will destroy the universe, the world everyone if he gets to see them so you can really kind of you can do some fun things with that in terms of the art style i liked it his character Mm -hmm. design uh because like you can either make wilson fisk this kind of tank um kind of and he's very slow and lumbering but then it kind of exudes kind of strength and kind of that whole thing together so I think they, they, they did that really well just by making him mm-hmm. very square with the big head. So the children kind of understand that he is very strong. Mm-hmm. Kind of yeah. it's, it's yeah. just, a, I think it's the way they designed because if he did a very much a kind of more realistic kind of like tombstone, that mm-hmm. style, you, they probably don't fully understand that he's going to be like this big. He can go toe to toe with 
like Spider-Man, for example. Yeah, yeah. And there's also that really interesting moment, as you mentioned, John, where uh, Vanessa and Richard are phasing in at the end when he's fighting with Miles on the train uh, in the final battle where he can't make it through the doors to even get close to his family as they're phasing yeah. in because of the size. It's just an interesting choice. And that's the kind of stuff you can do in animation that you can't do in movies. It just shows the separation differently than you would if you had him normal size. Yeah, yeah. Um, you did mention Tombstone. Not really too much to say about him. He's just the kind of hired henchman uh, in this movie. Um, and Scorpion, also a very different version of Scorpion than we've seen in the past. And the Ultimate Universe's version of Green Goblin that we see in this movie. Lots of different versions of these characters that we've seen. We know this isn't our universe. This isn't the Marvel Cinematic Universe version of Spider-Man because that's obviously Spider-Man Homecoming. Um, there's some very just interesting different touches that just give clues to the, to the fact that this isn't the regular universe, yeah. even down to the fact that Miles' father, who works for the police department, has PDNY on his uniform instead of NYPD, just showing slight differences mm. in the universe. Yeah, I weirdly thought that that said pony on the car. Uh, to <laughs> when, I, when, when I first saw it, I was like, is that just because it's like, it's their vehicles? <laughs> so they call them ponies. And then it's like, oh, that's a D. Yes, right. you okay. <laughs> literally, yeah. you just want a pony for Christmas now, don't you? That's, that, do, was, that was yeah. literally what this was all. This is a secretly just a long way to go. Surprise, we got you a pony. <laughs> yeah, it was my Felicity Jolly Hockey Sticks moment. Yeah. <laughs> where I just wanted to go bouncing into the new year on a pony. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this brought me to my one bit where I wasn't too happy. Which mm-hmm. is, the goblin is literally seen for 30 seconds, maybe, well not 30 seconds, maybe like say two minutes of screen, mm-hmm. like just for that scene where we were introduced to him. Um, oh, just such, you could, I, I want to see more of that character. We don't see what happens when Peter beats him or anything like that. Mm-hmm. I think the scorpion, that scorpion is actually a really underused for what he is. Um, so that's the ultimate version of Scorpion with some character yeah. designs. He's the kingpin of Mexico. Mm-hmm. So like he's this ultimate kind of bad guy. Um, uh, especially for all the Latin American gangs in Mexico and in uh, the United States. Like he's their El Chapo. He felt underused to me. Mm-hmm. Oh, big time. He's there to be one of the token bad guys. Yeah, I think he was there primarily for that final battle scene where you have so many different spider heroes um, and you need to introduce someone else that they have to fight with. Definitely. Mm-hmm. I completely agree. I would love to see more of uh this version of Scorpion because uh, I kind of quite like the character uh, as one of Spider-Man's um, villains. So uh, this was a nice new take for me. But yeah, completely underused. And I think really just to drive particular part of the story, yeah. really, from my side. Yeah. And I think before we move on to point number four, lest uh, us not forget um, the stormtroopers of this world, which are the lab coats from the uh, laboratory, which I have to say, as the two Spider-Men ran through the canteen, uh, and Peter B. Parker taking his bagel, like he said he would do. Mm-hmm. Um, I just love the fact that, is that Spider-Man? It was like, and all of a sudden, all the guns and the lasers, and you just hear this one shout of, he's got one of the bagels. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool. Again, the humor is so well written in this, because you're finding it's just like, you're, you're expecting them is to run away and go, oh my God, or <laughs> yeah. hey, can we take a photo? Then all of a sudden, like, all the guns come out. Um, so good. It was just so well done. Really well done. Well, perfect. Look, that leads us on to point four. And this is Miles's journey, uh, to becoming, uh, a hero. A lot, like with so many superhero movies and so on, you have this arc of how they get there. And here we get a very specific, uh, journey, which is through Miles because, um, I love the fact that he is surrounded by multiple versions of his own self who have uh, been through the same journey. Uh, and I think that comes really to, um, such an, a, a really good point where, um, you know, he has lost his uncle, his uncle Aaron. He's realized that his uncle Aaron is the prowler. You know, he, he's kind of been really defensive, but, you know, as, as, uh, Spider Gwen says, you know, 
of all the people, we're the ones that understand where you're coming from. You know, tragedy and loss is part of of this journey. You know, you think back to Peter Parker, certainly with the recent game on the PS4, yeah. you see that connection with Peter Parker and with Doc Ock. In the lab, that kind of surrogate uncle, yep. if you will, that person who has the same interests in science, tech, um, and who is kind of like the stand in for his uncle Ben at that moment until, you know, it all goes purse shaped. And it, it's the same here. And uh, I, I really liked, um, how all these different common threads were kind of pulled together here for, distinguishing Miles' journey uh, to becoming a hero. I thought it was really, really good. The way that they did this, and they did it really well, which was they explained how each of them had had tragedy and loss. Yeah. Be it in, well, actually, we didn't actually find out about Peter Porker's tragedy or loss. Uh, he was made into a bacon sandwich. Oh, okay. There we go. Yeah. In another reality. <laughs> mm, now I'm really hungry. <laughs> he, he, <laughs> he was involved in an Irish fry up. Ah, there we go. Um, but I really enjoyed that they, they explained this and how each of them have used that loss, that tragedy yeah. to push themselves forward. So we had, obviously, with for Peter A. Parker, Peter B. Parker, it was Uncle Ben. For Gwen, it was her Peter Parker. For Penny, it was Penny's dad. For Spider-Man Noir, I think he said it was his Uncle Ben as well. Or Uncle Ben. Yeah. He goes Uncle Benjamin, um, yeah. which was obviously to try and make it slightly different. I th- Yeah, so for Spider-Ham, it was his Uncle Back Bacon. Ah... <laughs> I don't know if that works, but I thought I'd throw it in there. Baby back, baby back, baby back ribs. Baby back, yeah, exactly. (laughs) So I'm so happy when they do this, which is, they actually even went a step further, which is, in your typical origin, you have, you do have this arc in the typical kind of superhero origin film. He kind of goes up and then he goes down and he goes up again and it ends everything happy, go lucky. They did do that. They followed the scripted origin story kind of like to a T, but it doesn't feel like that. It doesn't feel the contrived kind of element to it. Yeah, exactly. I think it's that element of it's familiar, but it's different because effectively he is dealing with his struggles um, or coming to terms with his new power, his new responsibility, effectively with himself, Mm. someone that has gone through it. And all of a sudden, you know, that moment when Peter B. Parker tells him, you're not ready, and and ties him to the chair and, and, uh, you know, effectively gags him, then you see that Miles is massively frustrated. He doesn't want that to happen, but it's coming from someone who has gone through that as well. And I have to say, that moment as well, for me, just as an offshoot, you know, brings a fantastic scene where, you know, his dad is the, he's seen that his, his brother oh, is dead. Yeah. Um, Miles can't speak because he's had the webbing put over his mouth to keep him in place. And, um, I, I think it leads to two fantastic moments that really then develop Miles' journey. Uh, and one is with his father, with his kind of family side. And that's because they have this moment where his dad effectively, um, tells him his, his feelings, his emotions towards him, towards the whole difficult situation of, um, Aaron's death or uh, of which Miles knows that's the prowler. And that gives him this emotional development here, I think. Uh, and he's unable to talk back. And you have that, you know, where the e- either side of the door, um, you know, and, and that is really, really good. But it also, you know, pushes Miles then onto this uh, leap of faith moment that Peter B. Parker has said that, you know, he has to take a leap of faith. And that comes then back on Peter B. Parker right at the end, where Miles says, trust me, take that leap of faith, you know, so that you can survive and get back to your world. Um, And that you need to take that leap of faith with 
Mary Jane. Yeah. And it becomes massively interconnected. So you don't just get the Miles journey. You get Peter B. Parker's journey. You get his dad's journey. Um, and I have to say that sequence where Miles takes that leap of faith off the building. Oh, not only my God. S- so good. I think, you you know, you that moment where he jumps off is something really special, you know, in his new costume that he's gotten from uh, and May that he has tagged himself. Again, just an other flavor of, of the character. And just with the music, the whole thing is massively um, crescendo building. It, it's really fantastic. And I, I think for me, that's it, it's just done so, so well. And it all comes down to that there is a familiarity to this. So you warm to it. But it is also massively different um, in the way it tells it. And I think at the same time, from Tauri in our feedback, it's just that it is with lots and lots of heart. Um, it really is. Um, so that's what I think is um, just so good about this um, development of Miles's journey uh, to becoming this hero that we see in that huge final battle. Mm-hmm. Ah, as you said, that kind of taking the leap scene has now become potentially my favorite 90 second cinematic scene. Just the, the rising crescendo, Aunt May sitting there um, going, what took you, took you so long? Like seeing him be- craft his suit, seeing his version, him wearing the, the, the Spider-Man suit underneath and then the hoodie and the shorts and the Nike Jordans and like, just, it's iconic Big seeing time. his fingers pull the glass off and shatter as he takes that leap of faith. And mm-hmm. I don't know what it was. Do you know when you get those kind of like those shivers? Uh, like you're listening, when you're listening to a song, goosebumps. goosebumps yeah. It, like I got that. I'm yeah. happy to say it. Like that was just a moment where I'm like, wow, the, the, the growth of a character getting to you that much, the, the, and it's probably just even the Spider-Man element to it. Seeing the, a Spider-Man for the first time take such a huge jump and swing. Mm-hmm. You couldn't do a movie back when I was a, probably a 12-year-old boy. Uh, now you can do it. But now they're doing an animated and it's yeah. just so visually impactful and stunning to look at. Um, mm-hmm. like I will be buying this in 4K when it comes out on Blu-ray. I will be mm-hmm. re-watching it multiple times just from uh, looking to try and find multiple things. But just for that one scene alone, it was just, oh, bravo. So good. So good. Really, really liked his journey uh, to becoming a hero. And they also fixed one of the things that people complain a lot about, about Peter Parker. So Peter Parker obviously got bitten by the spider. But in the comic books, he's also the creator of the web shooters. He's also the creator of his own costume as well. So in this movie, we have Aunt May saying she's the one that did all that work. So a nice fix in this universe that Aunt May is the helper of Peter Parker and now the helper of Miles Morales. Yeah, and I think that's so good. Like, you can go so far with this now because... We saw the different suits in the spider cave and the spider buggy mm-hmm. and the spider bike. So you have all these toys, all this history in this universe already mm-hmm. where we can see now, like, Aunt May will be able to be his Alfred, if we want to call it that, like in, in the spider cave. Yeah, possibly. Just she'll be able to guide him and help him. Um, because he is a smart kid, but he's not, he has, like, he's been doing this for like, what, a week? Less. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I, I just, yeah, it was fantastic. Really, really enjoyed it. And I wonder if she's going to be living in the spider cave now since her house has been destroyed by yeah. the <laughs> <laughs> But I, d- I did have a question. Um, you guys were talking about the, uh, the journey, the, the moment where Peter B. Parker ties up, uh, Miles and says he's not ready to become the hero that he is. I'm wondering if, that moment is because he's just lost his uncle and everybody else has experienced that moment and they've all taken their own time to get over that. We know in our, in the comic book universe, we know Peter Parker took a couple of months after his uncle Ben died to become the Spider-Man he needed to become. Um, I wonder if it's also a little bit of all of them recognizing that this is a huge moment that Miles needs, Miles needs to deal with and he's not going to be able to become the hero, but it shows you the strength of Miles that he is able to pull his socks up and get out there and, and become the hero to save this universe. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, like we were saying, it's to 
do with the fact that you have that really sort of emotional touching moment with his dad on the mm-hmm. other side and he's not able to express it back, but he hears the, the emotion, the love, the feelings of his dad to miles to the situation and everything like that. And I think that becomes uh, a catalyst to his own emotional development. You know, he's, he's been pushing his dad away. Uh, he's preferred his uncle. His uncle has now passed away, but it's realizing that there's a circle there of, of these two important people in his life. It's, it's not either or, it, it's both of them together. And I think there's an emotional development in his journey that allows him to become this hero by then, uh, again, having that, that kickoff point with the fact that he's learning from himself because of the other spiders being there the other spider heroes you Mm -hmm. know so um i think that's why he's able to do it yeah i love the line uh, when the predator when iron davis is dying and he turns around and says you're like me that's an emotional moment when you see uh his uh, miles dad there you see the predator dying you see miles kind of just standing over the body Oof, right in the, the heartstrings mm-hmm. and being able to see that play out. But you see Miles be able to go beyond that and go, I'm not going to be this group. I can be the hero. Yeah. Um, and I can get vengeance, but in a good way. It's justice rather than justice. So that's probably yeah. Yeah, the better way of putting it. Exactly. Okay. Let's bring it back now to point number five, which is the final battle. Mm hmm. Which is just a beautiful sequence. Ah, oh, so, so good. As I say, I mean, I've already talked about Ditko, uh, but this was just like, this was so nice for me. It did kind of remind me slightly of uh, a certain strange, but uh, I just love how the action happening in the machine, all these things coming through, seeing Vanessa and Richard, how that affects Kingpin, how, you know, the, the the simple act of trying to get the USB or the goober into the socket and and having the all these relationships. I like the fact that Miles is able to kind of say goodbye to each one of them mm-hmm. as they plunge down through the 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 splitting of realities and dimensions. And the I thought that was really really uh, great. And and in particular, just the 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 moment um, between. Miles and Peter B. Park about telling him that he can d- develop. As I was saying, uh, on, on um, the fourth point about Miles's journey, you see Peter B. Parker's journey, um, being told by Miles, well, you need to take that, take that leap of faith now. Mm-hmm. And then we also have the moment with Kingpin and, and, and Miles where Miles sees his father that gives him that strength. And again, linking yeah. back to that moment in his dormitory room. Um, as well, where he's not able to speak to his dad as his dad is talking to him. Yeah. Um, so it, it just, it just ties so many things together. And even with the aftermath of the battle and um, just the hug that he gives his dad, um, I was just like, <laughs> that was so, I mean, I, I was tearing up at that, to be honest. While um, dressed in the Spider-Man outfit, putting on the really deep voice going, I'm looking forward <laughs> to working with you, love you. And you're going, um, he doesn't know that you're Miles Morales. <laughs> Why are you saying that to him? Really, yeah, really good moment. Yeah, that was good. Really fun. And they have that great gag as well with uh, with how they take out uh, Dr. Octavius. They think it's going to be a really difficult fight where they have the three of them teaming up, Peter, ba- Peter B. Parker, Miles, and Spider-Gwen about to go at it with Liv, and she gets hit by a truck <laughs> coming through the dimension. So yeah, yeah. really nice touch. You know, there's one reason why I absolutely loved the final battle in this movie. Every medium's different. We've got all of these characters coming from comic books, a 2D format where you're flipping through the pages at your own pace. Nothing can ever replace that. A live-action movie, something like Spider-Man Homecoming, is a completely different format to this. The final battle in this movie makes use of every bit of animation they have used from the beginning of the movie. It feels like they were building up to this moment and executed it perfectly. Absolutely loved it. Yeah, I, I, I can't disagree from what john said in the 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 ditko elements where Mm -hmm. you have the buildings twisting and what better way to do it than when you have six people who can climb on walls 
Um, <laughs> why not put walls everywhere yeah. in every uh, like? And they started playing with the, the spatial awareness. So you had people on the ceiling fighting. Well, you also then you could see Spider Ham in the left hand side mm-hmm. uh, of the screen. Just really interesting to see how they kind of tweaked it all together. Um, so I was very very happy with how they did that. I can't say more. Like they get the goober in, and you get to say goodbye to Peter B. Parker, mm-hmm. and yeah. you get uh, John already kind of mentioned it earlier when we're talking about the the hero's journey but he gets to echo though that leap of faith mid battle scene yeah you get these kind of breaks in the battle in the action Mm -hmm. as you are saying goodbye to each of the spider personas yeah um oh and then the scene between gwen and miles Mm -hmm. which hints at the friendship maybe more (laughs) Um, she's 15 months older chris I know that's that's a that's a, a, that's a lot of time, yeah. <laughs> but at least they're friends, and yes, I love that moment—just the shaking of the hands as as they say goodbye. Wonderful final battle, absolutely loved it, guys. A couple of other things really that need to get into uh, on our notes about the about the movie. Obviously, as always, we do have our Stanley cameo, and um, this is probably the most emotional cameo I think we've ever seen, yeah. probably because Stanley passed away just a few months ago. So this is the first posthumous. Stanley cameo that we've seen, but it also made perfect sense. The actual way that he figured in this universe, that moment where he says, myself and, and Peter Parker used to be friends. It's a really sad moment. Yeah. Yeah. To say I welled up at this point, yeah. I was just like, I didn't think the element he says, which is anyone can wear the suit. It always fits. Um, uh, in the end, mm-hmm. I think I'm kind of, I'm bastardizing that kind of. No, no, that was almost exactly word for word, Chris. So <laughs> don't, don't criticize yourself. <laughs> This is perfect for me. It really was. And it's also a great slag on the salesman that was Stan Lee. That's what he was all about for his entire career after he finished comic books. He was just a sales guy. So this moment of him going, the suit always fits, and then you see the sign of no refunds <laughs> behind his head. Yeah. <laughs> all returns. <laughs> like, we've, we've got, what, two more cameos probably lined up? Uh, we don't is, even know just yet. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I, well, I'm assuming we've got a Captain Marvel and an Endgame. Mm-hmm cameo and then that's probably the end of it yeah. and anything after that is going to be posters or things like that but we have to see yeah really really good uh, the other real big moment that we need to talk about is the post credit scene um some people saying that if this wasn't included in the movie that it wouldn't have been the same thing they would have gone out hating the movie for not referencing the Spider-Man 1969 pointing at himself, in uh, which became a meme a couple of years ago. Uh, you'd see it all over Twitter with Sp- Spider-Man pointing at himself. And they do a great job of referencing it by bringing in the eighth Spider-Person, <laughs> Spider-Man 2099, traveling back in time to where it all began for animated Spider-Man, at least. Yeah, so th- this is great. This is setting up potentially the, the sequel. We see uh, Miguel O'Hara, who is Spider-Man 2099, with his uh, holographic AI assistant traveling back into the Spider-Verse to round up something. And the first one he goes to is the Spider-Man 69. Mm -hmm. And I just, oh, that, it just made, it was perfect. I loved it. I know. I'm not going as far to say if they didn't do the pointing, that would (laughs) have killed, like, no, like, come on. Come on. That's all I can say. Come on. Yeah. But it set to, it was a nice tone to leave it on. Mm-hmm. But it's setting it up as, oh, there's more. The, an even better one is we see Miles sitting by himself. I think it was on his bed and we get this light flash and we hear Gwen's voice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, setting up potentially he's going to be in her film. Mm-hmm. Um, and goes to her style, uh, or her universe. Um, I, yeah, so like this was just perfect for me. It's what Marvel do so well, and I think everyone's starting to get that, which is you tease, you leave just enough that people are going to create theories about this, yeah. but it can be funny as well. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that's it's the perfect post credit scene. I really just want to sit here and go through like almost like fifty different points and Easter eggs, but I'm not going to do that because it would turn this already quite long podcast into an even longer podcast Mm -hmm. so what i'll say is go over to the hollywood reporter search for spider-man into the spider-verse easter eggs and there's a hollywood reporter article which is very thorough um and it's called the definitive list 
of Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse Easter eggs. We've talked about so many of the Easter eggs throughout this, and there's there's so many other ones that are, that are in there. Just even the inclusion of of some of the big Spider characters, you know, like Spider Ham in itself, is an Easter egg that I absolutely love. So much great stuff in there. Probably my favorite though is the whole concept of having a comic book about Peter Parker in this universe that Miles goes to to see yeah. that the changes that are happening to him also happen to Peter Parker in this universe. I think it's a great touch. Yeah, I, I really uh, like the nod back to the comics. And originally I was like thinking, oh, they must be the original uh, issue number one, but it, it wasn't. Um, you know, it, it was kind of that idea that, um, that they're not the real first issue comics, as it were, but it's referencing both the people that created these fantastic characters along with then you know some of the kind of original pains i suppose and i really liked that and i liked how miles saw that and then repeated it almost exactly the same as peter parker where he's sticking to the side of the building uh, and so on right at the start when he wakes up the first night after being bitten by the spider and mm-hmm. um, i did also like the the funny moment of the the spider biting him it all being this rush and like intense music and then he just kind of taps it and flicks it off um, <laughs> at thinking that it's nothing um, yeah. but i i really like those elements um and yeah the comic um code logo at the start i, I think along with the sony pictures columbia just that phasing like you get throughout the whole movie mm-hmm. uh, i thought was really cool yeah the Statue of Liberty uh, turning into a cowgirl with uh, with guns and shooting was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, really good. There's a lot of Spider Man out there. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a there's a Spider Man made up of thousands and thousands of spider. Mm-hmm. I I kid you not. Oh yeah, that's a spiders man. That's in the new Spider Getting comic as well. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, uh, brilliant. And yep. Yeah, so look, uh, there is so many Easter eggs. Um, one that I did like, and I'm just going to end it on this, is the phone contacts, both in Miles's and Aaron's and Jefferson's uh, phone. You see the names of like S. Ditko and B. Bendis mm-hmm. and na- like all the well known, I say well known to like, but it's probably to us. They, they call out some names of well known artists and creators in comic books. Mm-hmm. So you see all these really nice. Uh, kind of nods. I think that's it. It's like an Easter egg should just be a nod to something that was influential in the build-up. Mm-hmm. So let's move into our defense. Derek, do you defend Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse? Mm-hmm. Yes, I absolutely defend this. Um, this is one of my favorite animated movies that I've ever seen. Um, and as I mentioned in my wrap up on, on the final battle, um, it's a different medium to the other movies. So luckily I don't have to choose whether it's my favorite Spider-Man movie of all time. It's just my, yeah. one of my favorite animated movies of all time. I had that moment of just giggling with enjoyment at what was going on on the screen in front of me and the characters that are in there and the storyline that was in there. I was laughing. I was crying. I was totally enraptured with this movie. And weirdly, we went to see it in the cinema in Switzerland. There's only uh, one screening of it that was on every day at half two in the afternoon. That was the first opening week of it. And also there was an intermission in the middle of the movie for yeah. 10 minutes uh, where it just had German adverts up on screen. And I just couldn't wait to get back to the movie. This was such an excellent experience. Absolutely loved it. Can't wait for it to come out on uh, Blu-ray so I can watch it straight through without any kind of German outbreak. Oh, yeah, it was proper old school. Like I was expecting the ice cream uh, to be coming round uh, down the aisle of the the theatre. Yeah, mm-hmm. really cool. Excellent. So, John, over to yourself. Do you defend this film, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse? I cannot recommend this enough, to be honest. Um, yes, I absolutely do defend this movie, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. I give it five seahorses trying to make it work out, uh, out of five. <laughs> uh, yeah, I absolutely really just was blown away by this um i really enjoyed everything about it um it was great seeing miles morales as uh the new spider-man i loved how it has so much heart so much emotion so much fun um so much wit cleverness the animation was fantastic i loved how self-aware it was you know for me it was just i think 
one of the best films, if not the best film I've seen this year. And mm-hmm. um, it got me crying at the, the final scene where he's hugging his dad. It got me, um, crying with him seeing that the prowler is one of his enemies that no sooner has he gotten than he's gone and it's his uncle. Um, it had me laughing out loud. It had me getting goosebumps and tingles at the leap of faith. Um, it was just, um, a fantastic film. Um, whether it's live action or animation for me, um, absolutely fantastic. And yes, I do defend this movie. Uh, and yes, uh, seahorses making it work is, is a thing. According to Peter B. Parker, yes, who would have thought it? Such a touching moment, isn't it? That that moment where he's describing watching that on TV, and you see a little tear in his eye. You know, if they can make yeah. it work, we can all do that. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> so, Chris, do you defend this Marvel movie? I, I'm echoing what both you said. This is now one of my favorite animated films of all time, mm-hmm. um, and right up there, it is. It is up there with one of my favorite Spider-Man films of all time. I'm so happy we live in a time where other kids can grow up and Miles can be their Peter Parker. Mm-hmm. So they, they they may not want, they may not relate to Peter Parker, but they may relate to Miles and that, he can be their Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. Um, and that could, this is a new origin for them. And if, I, I think that's the the key thing here, the, the, the comics universe, everyone can find a character that they relate to. And I think that's the, the really interesting part here. It's Spider-Gwen could be someone's, Spider Woman or Spider Man. So all these different spider personas can lead a person into the, the universe that we all love so much, which is comic books. This is a gateway drug <laughs> into uh, a, a ah. fantastic hobby that will live with them for life. Now it's a expensive hobby, unfortunately, because comic books, yeah, go on for hours. But yeah, there's a history in girth there. So I'm so happy that this will introduce a whole new generation to the Spider-Man mythos mm-hmm. in the world. This film, and we've said it, I don't want to cover and belabor too many points, is it has a lot of heart, but it also has some amazing animation. Mm-hmm. It has amazing writing. It has amazing action sequences. That two-minute or 90-second scene where Miles is taking the leap um, is just gorgeous. Yeah. This is a must-see film for everyone. Mm -hmm. You don't need to like Spider-Man. You don't need to like animation. You you don't need to grab your kids or your uncle or your aunts or your grandkids, whatever, to go see this. It is a film that can is for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think it will go down with that over time. Um, And I'm excited for the sequels. That's really it. And I think there's going to be a lot of people that are going to regret not seeing this in the cinema when it comes on TV in a couple of years or when they see it in... Uh, for rent in a couple of months time and they put it on their TV I think you're going to regret not seeing it in the cinema uh, if you don't take the opportunity while it's there because it is magnificent and it's not in 3D or we couldn't see it in 3D I'm really glad we didn't because there's so many great effects in there and the animation is used so so well it's so interesting that Marvel a couple of years ago made this decision not to do origin stories because they knew people were fatigued by seeing their favourite characters and their origin stories over and over again what they did in this film, what Sony Pictures have done in this film, is six individual origin stories for spider people. And we took it because yeah. it's so well written. We weren't fatigued with seeing the origin story. We were fatigued with seeing it done the same way over and over again. So give us something new. Do it like this. And I'll be queuing up to see it next time, too. Yeah. And I, I think that's the, the thing. If they can do this with other Marvel properties, mm. you could do some amazing things like yeah. the Ultimate X-Men. Uh, introduced by this way and things like that. Yeah. I want to. I want to see a Doctor Strange movie like this. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we all want to see another Doctor Strange movie mm-hmm. for sure. Yes, I'm hoping they go horror actually. But anyway, that's that's a well known thing from me. Yes. Well, look, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time, and I mean, as always, I enjoy discussing these things with you. Mm-hmm. But also, I love discussing it with our fellow defenders out there. And if you have any additional feedback, sure, throw it into the the post, into the group, and we'll respond as we go along. Don't forget to subscribe at DefendersTVPodcast.com, where you can link off to the iTunes, to the Android, to any good or evil, uh, Fisk-associated or not 
uh, podcast catchers. And don't forget to give us a like over on at Defenders Cast uh, over on Twitter so that you can keep an eye on all everything we are doing over the coming weeks and months of 2019. Yes, if you haven't joined us on our Facebook group as well, uh, as Chris mentioned, we do have spoiler posts up for everything that we're covering. So pop on over to our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Defenders TV podcast. As we're getting into 2019, we will be returning to the TV. We will be returning to Netflix with The Punisher Season 2 hopefully coming out during the month of January right now a date hasn't been confirmed just yet but we will have our review of each individual episode going up as we record them uh, during the month of January hopefully and then later on in the year we'll be returning to Jessica Jones with the final season possibly of Jessica Jones season three um, coming out later on in the year and we'll be continuing our MCU movie reviews with our review of Captain Marvel in March Mm -hmm. and then gentlemen we get Avengers Endgame in April. Yes, yes. Absolutely. It's going to be good. I'm yeah. much more excited for Captain Marvel right now because it's the next Nick Fury movie. So, hey, it's it made for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and it's 90s, uh-huh. so you'll get all the references. Yes, exactly, because I'm old. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us, fellow Defenders. This has been a absolute blast talking about this movie, and I can't wait to see it again. I can't wait to talk to you again about the next projects that we're going to be covering. Talk to you soon. Now that's a teaser. Bye. Thank you, fellow Defenders, for joining us. It's, as always, been a pleasure. I'm off to be not very cool at all, unlike Miles Morales. Um, And after that, we'll speak to you again in 2019. Bye. That's all, folks.